I'm Alan Salamont, the Dean of Tufts University's Jonathan M. Tisch College of Civic Life. Welcome today's lunch to, to today's lunchtime conversation with Catherine Gell, author of The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. I think we're all for that. I want to thank our co-sponsors for this event, Jumbo Vote, the Tufts Entrepreneurship Center, and the Political Science Department. I also want to thank Brian Schaffner, the Newhouse Professor of Civic Studies at Tisch College and in the Political Science Department for moderating today's conversation. We've been honored to present some outstanding guest speakers so far this semester, including Pete Buttigieg, Ambassador Capricia Marshall, Van Jones, Yamiche Alcindor, Congressman Joe Kennedy. We're looking forward to more great events in the coming weeks on Monday. Michelle Baudler, the Executive Director of the Tufts Health and Wellness, will, will talk about her new book, which was recently longlisted for a National Book Award. The title is, Is Rape a Crime? A Memoir, Investigation, and Manifesto. Next Wednesday, we will host activist Latosha Brown, who founded Black Voters Matter Fund. In November, we're going to hear from Congressman Adam Schiff, an actor and alumnus, Hank Azaria, among several others. We, uh, we hope you'll all register or you'll register for these talks and see our full lineup of speakers at tishcollege.tufts.edu slash events. And since our programs are all virtual, feel free to invite your friends, parents, alumni, and whomever you think would be interested. 2020 has been an election year like none other. And we have heard from candidates, policymakers, political strategists, journalists, and scholars who've offered their insights into this unique in American politics. Today, we take a step back zooming out from the all-consuming presidential race to focus on the structures and forces that will continue to shape American politics no matter who wins in November. That's the topic of Catherine Gell's book, The Politics Industry, How Political Innovation Can Break Partisan Gridlock and Save Our Democracy. Co-written with Harvard Business School professor Michael Porter, the book analyzes how politics in this country works, uh, like other competitive industries, and what that means for the ways in which politics doesn't work for the people it is supposed to serve. I'll let Catherine share her anal what her analysis reveals and how it points the way toward innovation and reforms that can strengthen our politics now and for the long term. With that, let me introduce our featured speaker. Catherine Gell is an author, business leader, and political innovator with vast experience in the public and private sectors. She was the president and CEO of Gell Foods, a high-tech food manufacturing company in Wisconsin. Her private sector career also included stints at Oracle and at Bernstein Investment Research and Management. In the public sector, Catherine worked in the office of former Chicago Mayor Richard Daley and for the Chicago Public Schools. From 2011 to 2015, she served on the board of the federal government's Overseas Private Investment Corporation. More recently, Catherine has focused on the urgent need for political innovation. She's co-chair of the National Association of Nonpartisan Reformers, a board member of Unite America, co-founder of Democracy Found, founder of the Institute for Political Innovation, and the CEO of Venn Innovations. Whew. Joining Catherine in conversation today is Professor Brian Schaffner. Brian is the Newhouse Professor of Civic Studies at Tufts University, an appointment shared by Tisch College and the Political Science Department. Before coming to Tufts, Brian was a professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and a faculty associate at the Institute for Quantitative Social Science at Harvard University. Brian's research focuses on public opinion, campaigns and elections, political parties and legislative politics. 
He has authored several books, including Campaign Finance and Political Polarization, When Purists Prevail, and Politics, Parties, and Elections in America. He's a much sought after political analyst, especially this year. And he's seen on the pages of the New York Times, the Washington Post, and other major media, out, media outlets, where his research helps provide valuable context about this moment in American politics. I wanna thank Brian for moderating today's conversation and Catherine for joining us and sharing her insights into how we can repair our democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Yeah, thank you, Alan. Um, and uh, thank you, Catherine. This is, I'm, I'm excited to spend the lunch hour talking politics um, and especially how to fix politics um, with you. And um, so I thought maybe we could just dive right in and um, talk about how your book begins, which is essentially to introduce the term political industrial complex. Um, can you explain a little bit about what that is and talk about the, this five forces structure and how that plays into it? Yes, uh, thanks, Brian. Thanks for having me here. And thanks, Alan, for that introduction. Political industrial complex. Uh, let me step back for a moment. So I'm mostly a business person and I ha have used sort of all these classic tools of strategy and looking at competition to make strategies for the companies that I have run or worked at. And the last time that I did my company strategy before I sold it was that in 2013, 14. And at that time, I had this epiphany that the things that I was looking at about my company were shockingly relevant to politics, which is to say, I was looking at my company and saying, I had a food manufacturing company in Wisconsin, we did make cheese. And I'm saying, how can I sell more cheese? And how can I make my customers happy? And then if I make my customers happy, I'll grow my business. And I started to have this sense well, how come in the politics industry, our elected officials don't seem to have to make their customers happy, at least not the customers that are the broad public, the voters, the public interest, and yet they still grow their industry. They still get reelected. Why is there a disconnect there? And then in my industry, if I don't do well in my company and don't make my customers happy. Eventually, assuming that there's money in this industry, a new competitor would come in and compete against me. And yet in politics, we don't see no competition, even though you know over three quarters, up to maybe 90% of people will indicate they're dissatisfied, for example, with Congress. And out of that came this idea of using these tools of competition to look at politics hence politics industry theory and the political industrial complex. And if I could real quickly, I have a colleague on the line. Can you just bring up the five forces, Kendra? There's a slide here that we use in business all the time to understand in an industry, who's getting the value. And in healthy competition, all the players in the industry are doing well. And the, uh, the companies do well if their customers do well, the suppliers do well, if there's opportunities for competition, et cetera. And this essentially, when we think of politics, I would call this whole chart the political industrial complex, meaning it's not just the Democrats, the Republicans and their political parties, it's the political parties plus everybody whose livelihood is tied up in this industry. The pollsters, the campaign consultants, the media, the lobbyists. Um, and this is an enormously large industry. It gets bigger every election cycle. It was a minimum of $16 billion uh, industry in 2016. And that's the political industrial complex. And here's the thing, that complex, is doing really well. It keeps getting bigger. It keeps having more power, having more revenue, jobs, more jobs, et cetera. And yet customers have never been more dissatisfied. And that's the heart of the disconnect that then we look at in the rest of um, our book and, and our work. 
Great. Um, do you, let me uh, take a step back and have you talk uh, a little bit about how you and your co-author, um, Michael Porter, came to just write this book in the first place. How did, how did you come up with this idea? Like you talked a little bit about your background, but how did, you know, how did you connect um, with Michael and how did this book basically come to, to where, it is, uh, where it is now, which is, you know, a, a finished product? Well, yeah, actually, to me, just a, a story of great luck in a lot of ways. So, you know, here I was, a CEO of this company. I'm doing my strategy. I was also, as a citizen, deeply involved in politics initially, you know, sort of traditional party politics and candidates. But I had come to understand that we had a systems problem. And then, as I said a moment ago, I had this clarity of understanding that not that competition is the only way to look at politics, of course not, but that it was uniquely helpful, in particular to many of my fellow business people, to use those analytics that they're familiar with, thinking about customers and suppliers, et cetera, to look at politics to sort of help bring them in. And um, I sold my company in part because I want to make these political you know, innovations, and then I, that was 2015, and after about a, less than a year, actually, I realized that business people were not getting engaged. To them, they were like, that politics thing, that is so irrational. I don't know why those people do what they do, but I, I, just, I would love to change it, but I just don't know what I would do. You know? So I'll keep my head down over here where I have more control you know, in my business. And that's when I said, I better write this up, which is to say, all of us, so the students we're talking to today, uh, community leaders, business people, every citizen really does, or at least a good portion of us need to be engaged in our democracy and in fixing this dysfunction. And so if business leaders were gonna be MIA, I thought that was gonna be a problem. And I thought, I know we'll write a case for investment, like we'll write the uh, return on investment, not of their money in politics, although that's true too, but of their time and their, and their mind share and their networks. And uh, so I had to make it super rational and I wanted to use this five forces and everything. And I'd already developed the whole five forces analysis, but this was fabulous. Uh, Michael Porter was a good friend of mine and he had helped me with the company strategy. So I went back to him and recruited him as a co-author of the work because he invented the five forces. He's the most cited you know, uh, academic on business and economics in the world. And so putting that combination together gives this analysis an instant legitimate, legitimacy among people who are familiar with Michael Porter's work. And that, you, look, you have to get a hearing and, uh, and people, it's like a due diligence itself. Like Michael Porter says, this is, you know, valid. And so the partnership's been super um, sort of leveraged that way. And eventually actually Michael's gotten very passionate about it as well, even though he certainly wasn't initially a politics person. So that's how it came about and uh, we love it. Yeah, that's great. Um, is there anything, just to follow up real quick, is there any, I've had collaborators before, um, and while we usually agree, sometimes we disagree. Is there anything as you were working on this project that the two of you disagreed about that you know that you had to sort of overcome? Uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's a tough question. I think the, I think the laugh might indicate that yes, um, and then there's the pause that indicates should I admit it and should I tell it? Um, so let's let's see. So yes, you know there were things very much not about the content. I would say that what was an interesting process is because this was you know, my analysis, my theory, and my background in politics and everything, the intellectual rigor that Michael brought to sort of questioning me made, forced me to explain the ideas better. So in the end, I'm going to say I, virtu I sort of virtually always won, meaning what I had originally said was correct. But by his questioning and my needing to 
you know, make it clear to him who was the best devil's advocate, then it really improved the book. So that wasn't, you know, any kind of a, a, a difficult agreement. And in that sense, we had different roles in the book. Um, and so that, that worked out pretty well. But what can I say? Uh, this could so easily be my last book. I mean, that is, the whole process is crazy. And then the <laughs> deadlines. And we have different views of deadlines. Yeah, Michael has a lot, sure. Michael has, let's just put it this way. Michael has a lot more power in the publishing industry than I do. So if he wants to push a deadline, he feels fine about it. And if I want to push a deadline, I feel Catholic guilt. <laughs> and so sure. it was funny. <laughs> Yes, academics take deadlines as suggestions, I think. That's probably a, <laughs> a it was truism. so clear. And I'm like <laughs> thinking, wait, we said we would do this, you know, being from, you know, running my company. Sure. And, but it all, it all worked out and here it is. <laughs> so let's go back into the, dive back into the content. Um, when you're talking about the, 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 how the, basically you, you mentioned that customers don't feel satisfied. And uh, I think you're right about that. I, I, I do wonder, um, what do you think about politicians? Do you think politicians are satisfied with the current uh, political industrial complex as it, as it exists right now? So, you know, we all have multiple, like if we ask us if we're satisfied with our jobs, we might sort of have to divide that into we like the work or we like our co-authors or we like our salary or not, you know, on any one of these things. Here's what I'll say. Uh, Justin Amash is congressman from um, Michigan, and he's very outspoken against the, about the dysfunction in Washington, D.C. And he and I are having, not direct, but on the podcast, Zoom circuit, having a bit of a disagreement over how much the politicians are satisfied. So my take would be that the system is ruining the job satisfaction and opportunities of, you know, 90% of the people in Congress and that the only people that like it how it is are leadership because they have an enormous amount of power that's really hidden from our view. We know the president has power, but most of us are less clear on the power of the Speaker of the House, not you certainly, or maybe even the people at this school, but um, less clear about the power of the majority leader and the Speaker of the House. In any case, I will say that what, if we change the system and we have healthy competition, that many of these same people could continue to get elected and now they would have the freedom to do what they know needs doing, that they come to public service and to elected office with good intentions. And then they find that their option is lockstep allegiance to their party or you're out. And that they make the trade-off and they don't necessarily want to get out. So they choose this lockstep allegiance, but they're not happy about it. And the good thing, but Justin's saying he thinks about 90% of people really just like the fame. And it's easy for them because lockstep allegiance means they don't have to decide. They just follow what the leadership has set. We'll see what happens when we get healthy competition. Either the current people will get reelected and do different things. Or, and maybe they won't get reelected, but we'll have people in there doing different things. Or, you know, they'll get reelected and they'll do a bad job and then new competition will come in and replace them. And so we'll sort of have our answer. So in a sense, it's all speculation right now. We just need a system that in the end, if they're not, the people who can do well in a system that's designed to solve problems, then they'll get weeded out. And that doesn't happen now. Right. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. Um, what do you so, think? Just quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, I you know I I think a lot of politicians are actually not particularly happy with a lot of the system that that I think you're kind of talking about here. Um, the you know candidates for either party are basically told here are the consultants you are allowed to hire. Um, the consultants get paid not you know based on how effective their um, their product is, but based on you know you know you know, how many television ads you run or something like that. It's essentially the, the uh, messed up incentive structures. So you talk about those messed up incentive structures, broadly speaking, but there's also sort of these really odd incentive structures, even just within the relationship between candidates and campaign consultants and the party who basically tells you, here's the list of consultants you're allowed to use. And, and you know, if you go off this list, we don't like that, basically. So I, I think 
a lot of politicians are not particularly satisfied with the choice, you know, with the limitations on how they hire people who work on campaigns and and how those how those people get uh, basically paid and <laughs> like the incentive structure is, is a little messed up. Um, and and I think then you can see how that would trickle down to what you're saying, which is like you know the voters aren't getting what they want because even the candidates can't get what they want. So it's it is a very interesting kind of closed loop. Um, but you 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 have two um, big reform proposals in this uh, that you that you put out there, and and one is very um, salient right now in Massachusetts, uh, and that's ranked choice voting. Um, and so you you say that you know one of the things we could change that would make a big difference is ranked choice voting. Um, I'd like you to talk a little bit about um, why that is, uh, and I'd also like to hear how you would respond to the critics of ranked choice voting, um, who I think have a variety of concerns, um, including the fact that it's more complicated for voters, which means maybe it's biased towards people who are more sophisticated about politics. Uh, I might feel like it might shut out some people who are more, uh, who are less interested in politics and less engaged in the political system. Uh, it takes longer for people to vote uh, by ranked choice voting, which means you know these long lines that we're seeing may become even longer. Um, and um, just in general, I, I'd love to hear not just your, your pitch for RCV, but also how you would answer its critics. Yes, super important. So um, it might be a theme of how I answer questions to step back for a moment to some bigger picture on it. But everything that, that I care about in this work is directed towards an outcome that's a couple step remo steps removed, which is to say, ultimately, whether our analysis and our solutions are the correct ones will be determined by if, if and well, when they're implemented, does Congress now produce more results in the public interest, solve more problems, work together to deal with the trade-offs in, in a new way so that the country is getting what the country needs. And so everything is about results. So when I step back from that, one of the main reasons why we don't get results is because there's no accountability for not getting them. And that refers to something I said before, which is there's accountability in the private sector. If you don't get results, then a new competitor, an entrepreneur, will come in to take your customers away. And that's what competition does. It forces innovation and results. And so ranked choice voting for many people is exciting to them because they believe in the benefits of um, sort of having, they believe in these benefits of having more choices. They think it reduces negative campaigning, can increase turnout, and makes the outcome more fair and more democratic. I believe those things too. I think it's more fair. I think it's more democratic because you're going to get a majority winner. But here's the other thing I believe. As much as Americans, we love our democracy and our freedom, and we want it to be fair, and we want it to be representative, you know what we really want? People want to believe that their children's lives are going to be better than theirs. They want to be able to believe in the American dream. They want to see the country working, which is to say they want results. So, so the reason I like RCV, ranked choice voting, the reason I like ranked choice voting is because it creates an opportunity for new competition in a way that our existing system does not. Which is to say, if it just was more fair and more democratic, I wouldn't be promoting it. Mm. Because fair, democratic, and the same crummy results, we're gonna have the same problem. Mm. So, so what RCV does is by getting rid of the spoiler argument, now we can have new competitors. And just for the audience, so the spoiler argument is what happens when someone tries to run as an independent or a third party and is essentially said, oh, you know, the voters are told, don't vote for the Green Party candidate Jill Stein in 2016 in the presidential because you'll take votes away from Hillary and spoil the election for her. 
and inadvertently help elect Donald Trump or on the right, don't vote for the libertarian candidate because you'll do the same thing to Trump. And that's the spoiler effect. And that's the main reason, it's not money, although that's part two, but the main structural reason why there's no competition in politics is because we have a spoiler problem. Ranked choice voting makes the spoiler problem go away. And therefore the most powerful pressure mechanism on serving the customers is the threat that if the Democrats and Republicans don't do the job, someone else will. That's why we need RCV. So those of you in Massachusetts, yes on two, you know, yes on two. That's what I'm about. And you're not worried though um, that it's going to maybe oh. cause inequalities that um, some people who, are, who just have the resources to be more engaged in politics are, are going to benefit from this, whereas other people are going to find it compli too complicated, maybe uh, drop out of the electorate or, or only maybe still only vote with one choice, but then that maybe puts them at a disadvantage to people who are ranking, say, six candidates. Uh, is that you know, not a... Yeah, you know, so here's what I'm most worried about, the current inequality of results that our system delivers. That's, that's the real outrage. So, and our current system, like 100% for sure gives us that. So therefore, this new system of ranked choice voting, which, you know, gets rid of the spoiler, I mean, that's clear it gets rid of the spoiler, um, will likely change results for people. And in that, is it, I, that, that's even more important, even if it were like slightly more complicated, because it's totally worth it. But having said that, it's not too complicated for people. We Americans are not less able to do this than the Irish or the Australians or all the other places where it's used. And we do this in our lives all the time. And I'm, I'd like my colleague to just quickly put up a ballot, uh, just the one that shows the five choices, not the grid. This is the way we think about things from ice cream flavors to, you know, what movie we want to watch. It's sort of like, well, this is my favorite, but if it's not available, this would be my second choice all the way down to, well, if I'm going to have to have, I don't know, what would be the worst ice cream flavor? You know, I guess there are no bad ice cream flavors, but you know, if I have to eat pizza with olives, then I just don't want it at all. So this is how the ballot looks with ranked choice voting, the theoretical ballot. I love this person all the way down to the fifth choice over my dead body. Do I want that person to be my representative? It is rational. People are used to thinking that way. Now, having said that, nobody needs to rank all the candidates. Their ballot is good and they are not less powerful than they are in the existing system when they only get to choose their favorite and they don't get to opine on anyone else. Mm -hmm. So it's better than the existing uh, by far and it's not too complicated. And I think, Brian, all those arguments that are brought up are brought up by the players in the existing industrial complex who have optimized their livelihoods around those existing rules of the game. And they got to find something to say to make the power, you know, to sort of choose who's going to run through the primary system and everything, not go away from them and go back to people and go back to majorities. So you can always find something wrong with something and that's what they're going to go with because there's nothing really powerful to go with. So um, the other, great. So this, so the other um, reform that you talk a lot about has to do with primaries. I wonder if you could talk about um, how we, you know, how we do, what you, th what you think is wrong with how we do primaries right now um, and how you think we should fix it basically. Mm -hmm. Thanks for asking because you're right. I like two things. And by the way, I talk about them as political innovations instead of political reforms because innovation is breakthrough and innovation is not tinkering around the edges. It's not Trojan horse for party gain like some reforms are. You know, it is very nonpartisan and it changes results. Um, 
So the two I like, ranked choice voting, but then that's preceded by primaries. And here's why we need to do two together. And then I'll talk about the primary. The things that we're missing in our politics industry are innovation, results, and then accountability for those results. And these are like a, these are a trio of things that healthy competition delivers and we don't have them in our politics. So I think, think of this as sort of free market politics, but well-regulated, you know, free market politics. And um, the primary is the key structural reason why we don't have results, because here's how it works. Primaries are low turnout elections and voters who show up for party primaries tend to be more ideological than voters as a whole. And that pushes the candidates further to the right and further to the left than voters as a whole really want. Now, most people are sort of familiar with this because they see, you know, they talk about that going, going to the extremes, but far less of an issue. Uh, but, but what they have to say to get elected is not at all the real problem. We need to look further and see how primaries affect the actions they take and on whose behalf they're taking them when they're legislating. So here's how that works. Let's say now people are in Congress, they made it through their primary and the Democrats and the Republicans have the opportunity to consider a bipartisan compromise bill, maybe on one of our biggest issues, immigration, healthcare, debt deficit reduction. They look at that uh, each, let's say two house members and say, is this a good idea? Is this the right policy to move the country forward? Maybe they say, is this the, what the majority of my constituents in my whole district want? But actually they don't ask themselves any of those questions because the first thing they ask themselves is, will I make it back through my next party primary if I vote yes on this bill? And if the answer to that question is no, and on all the big issues, it's pretty much always no for both sides because they've divided themselves so far apart that any compromise gets them kicked out in their primary in large part because of who turns out there. And therefore, the answers to all the really important questions are fundamentally irrelevant in their current decision-making process. And that's why we don't get any results. I say that the party primary creates a proverbial eye of the needle that is so small that no problem solving politician can pass through it. So what we do in our proposal, and we talk very much about this in the book, by the way, with a lot of great stories about sort of how this looks in the drama of it. We don't just analyze, we tell good human, can you believe this happened stories. Um, and when we put two things together, uh, getting rid of party primaries and replacing them with open top five primaries and getting rid of plurality voting and replacing it with ranked choice voting. We call the package final five voting. And we explain that when we put in final five voting, we change how we vote, we change the incentives that govern behavior. And out of that, we'll connect serving the public interest with getting reelected and we'll get innovation results and accountability from our politics. So we should do both. I hope, you know, after Massachusetts wins on uh, ranked choice voting, that they will come back and address this party primary, you know, problem, let's say in the next election cycle. So when, so thinking about primary, I, th I think we can think of great examples of where we feel like this has been a problem. Um, I think sometimes when I, I think sometimes we can think of times when this maybe we feel like it hasn't been a problem. Um, and I guess one example that sometimes, you know, certainly I hear from my students is AOC, for example, um, who definitely replaced, I would say, a more moderate member of the Democratic Party. But also by winning that primary, um, you know, brought representation for other groups that don't often get represented. So like as a working class, uh, you know, younger um, woman of color uh, that she's representing constituents that, you know, were not being represented before. So I wonder, you know, are, 
like, is it always bad? <laughs> is primary and always bad? Um, and you, you, can we, you know, can we think about, or is there more nuance there than maybe we're letting on, I guess? Part, so nothing's always bad. You know, and we can have anomalies to the sort of bad or good in any system that we exist in, in our homes, in our lives, in, in our politics. But, but having said that, yes, party controlled primaries are always bad, okay? Because <laughs> they always create this tiny little needle. And AOC didn't need the party primary to win. She could have won in a, you know, uh, open top five primary with ranked choice voting in the general election. And then AOC wouldn't have been such incredible news because it was news because she beat an incumbent. Why, if nobody likes Congress, are no incumbents ever defeated? So instead of thinking of AOC as, oh, that's an example of the system working, let's think of an anomaly where we're so surprised when an incumbent that's part of a completely dysfunctional Congress that doesn't solve anything loses is a surprise. Then that tells us the system is wrong. And this new system doesn't, uh, you know, again, lessen the opportunities in, in for, for new competition or for alternate views and for more voters to have power, it increases them. Let me, let me say something. Political innovation, and particularly this final five voting, is not designed really, is not designed primarily to change who wins. It's designed to change what the winners are incented to do and on whose behalf they're incented to do it. So here's another way of putting that. Um, I, I'm politically homeless. That's how I sort of think of my party affiliation. I'm politically homeless in today's duopoly. I don't have any problems having said that with over the long term, you know, sort of the Republicans or the Democrats. I don't have any problem with political parties. I don't even have a problem with two political parties being the major ones. The problem is that the current two are guaranteed to continue to be sort of into the future, the only two, regardless of what they do or don't get done on behalf of the broad public interest. And that's the problem. So what happens in competition is that either the existing people will change their behavior and then they'll start delivering results or they'll be supplanted by a political entrepreneur who comes in. And it's that you know, combination, because what, what we want to do in politics is we want to have a lot of views. We want to have lots of ideology. I don't believe in a squishy middle. We want to have lots of views across the spectrum and maybe different kinds of views that don't even get on this you know, sort of horizontal line. And then, and keep the debate and keep the entry for all of this policy innovation and new types of candidates and constituencies. But then at the same time, incent them once they arrive in Congress with those views to be able to advocate powerfully for them, but nonetheless work with people who arrived in Congress with different views and different you know, districts with their desires and then work together. So it's sort of the best of both worlds. Great. Yeah, good. Great points. Um, let me ask you another question that I think is interesting. It's something that a lot of political scientists uh, sort of, I think, debate each other about. Um, and I think there's there's some there's one class of political scientists who say, yeah, it's a system that's broken for sure, um, you know, and um, and that's the issue. And then there's another set that say, it's not the system that's broken. It's the Republican Party that's broken. That actually, if you look at the Democratic Party, it's it's functioning more or less fine. It has not become an extreme party in the same way that the Republican Party is. And they say, you know, so, you know, we're, we're doing this false equivalence thing when maybe we shouldn't be. And so you could look at, for example, you know, comparing 2016, the Republican Party nominating Donald Trump and, in a field of, a, you know, whatever it was, 16 candidates. You know, the Democrats this, this year in the primary season also had, um, you know, 20 candidates or whatever it was. And they, they certainly had some figures in that field that were more Trump-like than others. Um, and they ended up nominating the person who was probably the most, you know, 
I don't know, maybe would have won in a ranked choice voting format, but was certainly the more moderate choice and someone who wasn't necessarily opposed by most, um, wasn't opposed strongly by most Democratic yeah. voters. So I guess the question is, you know, are, are we, is it really that the system is broken or is it that one of the parties is broken? And, and if, if, that, if that part, if that piece, if that party was fixed, we wouldn't necessarily be having these conversations. It's a totally legitimate question. Here's how I answer that. Because the main question that we try to answer in our work and offer to people is how could we fix this? That requires looking more deeply into system and how things look going forward than focusing on the now, which also means that it requires more looking backwards because you have to see how things have been over time. So false equivalence is a problem always, well, in the duopoly, okay, two, it's a problem always in any like sort of um, time snapshot that you can make. And you will be able to say that so-and-so started it and that this side is worse, et cetera. And, and not even that everybody will always agree on what that snapshot tells you, but that's always a problem when you take this short time. And that's why I think that people legitimately, uh, you know, have that concern because we're so much in the drama of, of current things. But the system itself and how it's designed as a political industrial complex where all the players do well and the public interest doesn't do well is created by the two halves, not just the parties, but the two halves of the political industrial complex as a joint project. The fact is Washington isn't really broken. It's doing what it's designed to do, but it's been designed and optimized by and for the benefit of the two halves of this political industrial complex. And they work really well together in one particular way. And that is to rig the rules of the game behind the scenes outside of our view to protect themselves jointly from new competition. So again, you will find plenty of cases where you can say so-and-so started or this was way worse. And in many cases, you'll be right. But if you look over time, you'll also find, like I'll answer your question here because you specifically noted that certain Democrats right now want to say the Republican side is worse. Um, and a lot of prominent people uh, say that and write books about it. Uh, but you just have to look over time. Let me give you a couple of examples. You know how um, Democrats are really angry about Republican gerrymandering in 2010 uh, after the last census? Well, I'm from Wisconsin, and prior to the, uh, after 2008, the Democrats had a trifecta in state government. We had the assembly, we had the Senate, and we had the governorship. I say we, I mean, I was, mm -hmm. in any case, Democrats had that. And there were calls for the Democrats to create a nonpartisan redistricting commission. Mm -hmm. What did the Democrats in Wisconsin do? Hmm. They didn't do that because they planned to still be in control in 2010 and they planned to draw the districts to benefit them. Well, you know what? They lost in the 2010 midterms, as did so many Democratic legislat legislatures around the country. And I'm not saying the exact same thing played out everywhere. And then the Republicans drew the lines. Uh, could you say they drew them more egregiously than the Democrats were going to do? I don't know. But the the point is, it takes two to collude in this system. I'm going to give you one other example. This is the only industry, really, where the players themselves write the rules of the game. So when I make the, like a presentation to business people, someone comes up to me after and they say, I know, let's have an antitrust lawsuit against you know, the parties. But conveniently, antitrust regulation doesn't apply to these political parties. So here's, here's an example. They write the fundraising rules. And the last time the two major parties got together to write the fundraising rules, this is what they came up with. $847,500 annually, you, Brian, or me, or anyone who's listening, we can give 
to the Democrats, you know, through all their party committees and candidates, et cetera. And if you want to play both sides, feel free to give another 847,500 to, you know, Republicans. But if you would like to give, if you would like to donate to an independent candidate who wants to say that's broken and I have a new vision, and that independent candidate wants to run for the House or the Senate, you are, limit, you are limited to $5,600 every two years. Now, that's a barrier to entry, right? Because you can't get capital for your new business, for your political entrepreneurship. And they both did that. And they did that together. So what, and go back, go back decades and years, and you'll see who took down the slippery slope of how they were running Congress, because it's not just about elections, it's elections machinery, it's also about legislative machinery. You know, it's a race to the bottom. In the short term, you'll always find someone to blame more. Great point, great point. Um, so I think now we're gonna turn it over to some questions from uh, our attendees. And um, I think we're gonna have Nico first. Uh, hi there. Uh, so my name is Nico Lemieux, and I'm an alumni in Fletcher School of Tufts and a strategy consultant in the sustainable investment space. So in the same vein that you mentioned about, you know, politicians having the ability to step away rather than following lockstep with the party's power machinations, that's personally why I'm a huge fan of Justin Amash and, you know, AOC and the like that really are outsiders working on the inside and grinding everyone's gears in the process. Um, in that vein, you uh, supported my friend Greg Orman in his independent bid for Kansas governor after in 2014, he came very close to getting elected to the Senate. So what I'm wondering is that in the absence of ranked choice voting, how do we get non-millionaires to viably compete and win as third party candidates? Um, so there'll always be exceptions. But what I'll tell you is in the absence of ranked choice voting, we don't get non-millionaires to compete as viable third party candidates. Meaning you'll have a few here and there, but not enough to alter the accountability that's lacking in politics. Uh, I think, that, I think that, the, that the way forward is started by telling the truth about what's so now. And by saying, you know, that the emperor has no clothes and by being willing to place blame on the system and being willing to look at the long term. And the fact is, if we do not get rid of first past the post voting where someone can win with a plurality and where you have this spoiler argument, there is no amount of money that's going to get over that. I, here's an example. Howard Schultz, uh, founder, former CEO of Starbucks explored an independent run for president in the spring of 2019. And by the way, I focus very much on Congress. We're not gonna elect one leader that'll transform us all. We can go, we can reform up and reform down to the states, but the linchpin is Congress. But having said that, Howard Schultz was gonna run as an independent. And once he you know, made that known, the outcry from Democrats was vicious because they believed that Howard was closer to a Democrat because he had been a Democrat and that he would take votes away from the eventual Democratic nominee and spoil the election for that person. And so he really, he did then not run. And, 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 and so what we're left with is a situation where essentially politics is the only industry where we're regularly told that less competition is better for the customer. And for the purpose of understanding that, nobody on this call, it doesn't matter if anybody thinks Howard would have made the best president or an awful president, we can still understand that there's something fundamentally unhealthy about a system where having more talented, passionate, accomplished competitors is somehow wrong. So in that case, you know, Howard uh, could have self-financed a certain portion of his campaign, certainly, and money didn't get you past that. We have to have ranked choice voting, and we have to combine it with getting rid of party-controlled primaries. We need final five voting, but I'll say one other thing. That sounds like we need, we need, we need. 
But here's what is interesting. We don't need it in all the states to make a difference. So if only five states implemented final five voting, we'd be sending 10, Cong 10 senators, we, the American public at large, you know, would be sending 10 senators to the US Senate under new rules of the game, which give them the freedom to work together and the freedom to answer to the general election voters and not be in lockstep. So they may still be Republicans and Democrats, or maybe they'll be an independent or something, but they have more freedom and they form kind of a fulcrum that could be a problem solving fulcrum and begin to alter the legislative calculus for everybody, which is why, you know, all these changes get made on a state by state basis. And I'm really happy to know that we don't have to wait for 50 states to quote, do the exact same thing. We can have these laboratories of democracy and see how far we get. Great. Um, so I think our next question comes from Michael. Yeah. Hi, Catherine. Uh, it's Hi, nice Michael. to hear your talk. I only got a little bit through your book as of right now, but, you know, this is a good opportunity to hear a little bit more about it. Um, earlier, uh, Professor Schaffner was asking about, um, you know, what type of inequality ranked choice voting could create uh, along socioeconomic lines by essentially requiring uh, the voter to do more research on the long list of candidates. Would you then be an advocate for supporting compulsory voting as a means of kind of mitigating those effects? Uh, thanks, Michael. It's again, a good question. And first of all, thanks for buying the book. And it's a good time for me to say to everybody, uh, please do buy the book uh, because, well, I like it, but um, all the proceeds, all the author's proceeds of the book go to the Institute for Political Innovation, which is a not-for-profit dedicated to you know, moving these ideas forward. So it's not like I can buy another pair of shoes, no matter how many books you buy. Um, but symptom, uh, well, so again, I, I reject that the trade-off is on the negative side of ranked choice voting with the current system in terms of adding to uh, complexity in a way that exacerbates any inequalities. Um, I actually see, I mean, when I get in the details, I see a lot of really exciting opportunities, which is people who wouldn't previously have been able to run, being able to get into a party primary and only, uh, the nonpartisan primary, and only spend enough money to be like in fifth place, but, you know, but sort of motivate a whole constituency of previously unrepresented voters. And then they get into the competition and they may not win in the end, but they're a voice of new ideas, innovation or new constituency. So the benefits far outweigh the negatives, but nonetheless, as you noted, then another question comes, well, should we uh, have mandatory voting? And one of the reasons people want to do this is because they want you know, the democracy to reflect everyone's views. But I'm not a fan of mandatory voting. And, and here's why. First of all, if you just put mandatory voting in right now and everybody went and chose, and, and we left all the other incentives the same, you just have more people voting for the same choices that we have today. And the election still would have only been decided in the primary. So actually, if you were going to do mandatory voting, you should mandate it for the primary because that's the only one that pretty much ever matters. And, and it's like, it's like fake to tell people it will make a difference if you show up when the only thing it will really do is maybe someone else would get elected. But remember, I said, I'm less concerned about who gets elected and more concerned about what the winners do with that and on whose behalf they do it. So it, it won't alter it. And here's the best way to get more people to vote. Have their vote matter. Have their vote matter. And when we have healthy competition, their vote will matter. And I think it is a travesty that in the great American experiment, so many people's votes don't matter at all. And this system would make that difference, but not, again, not just so we can count up the votes and say that our person won, but so that all the people in Congress, even the ones we didn't vote for, actually care 
about the broad public interest. And that even though we'll continue to have different ideas, we sort of, you know, move forward like this. And that's, that's the best. Actually, I'm sorry, I'm going on a little long. Let me say one thing. Winston Churchill, I, I sound really excited about final five voting and I am. So some people say, oh my goodness, you're so naive, you know, because there's all these other problems. There's money in politics. There's people not voting. All, there's partisanship. There's media, everything. Yes. But here's the thing. Winston Churchill is known to have said, um, oh, democracy is the worst form of government out there, except when compared to all the others. And Winston Churchill is right. Democracy is messy and it is hard. And here's what we have right now. Democracy that is messy, hard, maybe even let's call it ugly, and bad results. With final five voting and healthy competition, combined with you know, some changes in legislative mechanisms, et cetera, we will have a democracy that is messy, hard, with some good results to show for it. And that is utopia for democracy. And that's what we need to go for. Thank you. Great. So we have uh, time for one last question. And uh, Daniela, I believe, is going to ask it. Hi. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Um, I'm from New Mexico. And something that I've heard a lot, especially from my peers in Massachusetts, who are Massachusetts voters, is, oh, I'm from Massachusetts. We're a blue state. Biden is going to win no matter what. And so I'm curious how we can incentivize voters in states that are, you know, traditionally blue or traditionally red to vote when they feel that their vote doesn't matter. Thank you, Daniela. Again, a good question. And for me, it starts with the truth, which is we don't try to tell people their vote matters when their vote doesn't matter. So the fact is that unless everybody stayed home, you know, votes relative to the presidential in Massachusetts, one person's vote does not make the difference. And again, let's just tell the truth about that, which is why, you know, let's not pretend that if we had mandatory voting, things would change because that's not where the total problem is. But all their votes matter for who gets elected, for, uh, for who gets nominated in party controlled primaries for the House and the Senate. So again, for most people, we want to motivate them in existing system to vote in the party primary, because that's where their votes would make the most difference. I always tell people, if you could only have time to vote once, just show up in the party primary. All this corporations, let's give election day off. I just say, no, hey, corporations, let's give party primary day off until we change it. So uh, by the way, when we get rid of party controlled primaries, the general election will always be the most important election, which it should be. So, so let's change the system, then everybody's votes will matter. But in the meantime, again, tell them their vote matters for all the other elections because the president does not save us. The system is way bigger than any one president. I think presidents can make things worse. I don't think presidents can change the trajectory on all of our uh, huge issues on the economy, on healthcare, et cetera. Um, I, and, we tell them that their engagement matters on not just voting for candidates, but on showing up in Massachusetts to vote on structural reform. After you get through all these candidates in Massachusetts, they have the opportunity to vote yes on two, which is foot rank choice voting in. So tell any of those people that in my view, again, if we wanna look at the long-term and how their lives are gonna play out, creating a more competitive system, as intense as this election seems, creating a more competitive system for the next 10 elections, well, the next 20 they're gonna live through, that is totally worth showing up for. Great, that's a, that's a great uh, message to end on. And um, uh, so I, I can't believe we're already up after just an hour. I, I think we could, I, could, I would love to keep this conversation going, but, um, and, and, and hopefully um, there'll be a, a venues to do that going forward. But I just want to thank you, Catherine, for joining us today. That was, that was a terrific uh, event. And I want to thank the attendees uh, for being here as well and for your great questions and, um, you know, vote. <laughs> vote. Absolutely.
Thank you.